Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's webinar, A Sustainable Construction Industry, What Does the Future Look Like? My name is Jane McMaster and I will be your host for today. First, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to their cultures and to Elders past, present and emerging. It is in fact a genuine pleasure to be here today for this webinar. As many of you will have noticed, pressure on skill shortages has hit the mainstream media fairly hard over the last week to 10 days. Many professions and vocations are feeling it and, the, and engineering is no exception. In fact, with 58% of the engineering workforce in this country being skilled migrants and with recent border closures now extended, a strong demand for engineering skills is being felt across many sectors and disciplines, including construction, where the challenge is exacerbated by a healthy pipeline of future projects. I'm just a little bit more excited for this event than normal, and the reason is it's a little bit different to a normal webinar or panel discussion. I don't know if you observe when you attend events such as these, but they are usually, in my experience, almost always describing a problem that needs fixing, albeit an important problem in most cases. It reminds me of a time when I used to work at the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet at the time when Tony Abbott was Prime Minister. One day he passed some feedback to our team on a brief we had written on some policy issue that I can't remember today, and the feedback was, please stop admiring the problem. In other words, we'd used the brief to provide an elaborate description of the problem at the expense of offering some insight about what might be done about it. That was many years ago and ever since, it has led me to observe that most speeches and conversations are devoted to admiring problems at the expense of offering some insight about what might be done to address the problem. Today is different. Today we have the chance to hear about and indeed launch an important initiative that has been the labour of love of a group of people who have worked tirelessly for the last two years to address a range of challenges in the construction sector. We get to hear about something that will help resolve a problem and that is a wonderful thing. So yes, today we will, we will be exploring the range of challenges within the construction centre um, sector and the opportunities they present. And most importantly, we'll be also talking about the launch today at this webinar of the Construction Engineering Learning and Development Guide, an industry first, the result of a truly collaborative partnership between the Australian Constructors Association and Engineers Australia. This is a comprehensive training and development guideline to support the career progression of construction engineers by providing sector-specific benchmarks for skills and competencies. The Learning and Development Guide will provide some clarity on career paths and relevant learning and development options, enabling people to have greater understanding and control over what they can do to progress their career in the sector and provide some consistency and expectations for skills and competencies across construction. This in turn will help secure a pipeline of engineering skills that the sector requires to deliver on the ambitious future project pipeline. The guide is the culmination of more than two years of hard work from a large group of people. In particular, I would like to acknowledge the contributions from the following people. Tom Laslett, Project Manager, New South Wales ACT Infrastructure from John Holland, who was the chair. James Glastonbury, EGM of Engineering Technology and Innovation, McConnell Dow. Con Butakakis, Project Director from Fulton Hogan. Tristan Walters, Alliance General Manager of Southern Program Alliance. Uwe Hesterman, General Manager, Engineering, McConnell Dow. Ron Thomas, General Manager, Engineering, CPB Contractors. Remy Short, Communications Manager, Fulton Hogan. And Noel De Santos, General Manager of Business Growth at Engineers Australia. We're now going to hear more about the need that the Construction Engineering Learning and Development Guide is addressing, the gap it is filling, and how it will do that, from our keynote speaker, Sarah Marshall, who I would now like to welcome. Sarah Marshall is an Australian Constructors Association board member and the executive sponsor of their Capability and Capacity Board Committee. The Capability and Capacity Committee has the aims of achieving a sustainable pipeline of people choosing to work within the Australian construction industry and a workforce within the construction industry with the requisite skills or opportunities to develop those skills to deliver exciting projects across Australia. Sarah brings over 25 years of experience working in the construction and infrastructure industry and is a highly respected leader that has spent her professional career spearheading positive cultural change in the industry 
This includes driving infrastructure sustainability, reducing the stigma of mental health issues, increasing Indigenous engagement and procurement, workforce employment, skilling and training, and driving improvements in diversity. Sarah is currently the General Manager of People, Safety and Sustainability at Fulton Hogan. She is Deputy Chair and Board Director on the Infrastructure Sustainability Council of Australia and a previous Board Director on the New South Wales Architects Registration Board. She has been the ACA Champion for the Construction Engineering Learning and Development Guide and I would now like to invite her to speak. Please welcome Sarah Marshall. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional owners of the land that I'm working on today and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to pay my respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us online today. I acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people will always hold a spiritual belonging and connection to country and remain traditional custodians and first people of this land. So I think um, you've just heard a lot about me, uh, so I won't go over that again. But I guess from my perspective, I've spent the last 25 years working in the construction industry. It is an industry that I love. It is an industry that gives contrib that contributes so much back to community. Um, and I have spent my entire career working towards making a positive cultural change in the industry. I'm thrilled to join you today in discussing the future of construction, the opportunities that lie ahead, the challenges that we need to address, and the critical role construction engineers and industry play in driving its transformation. In, the, in an industry first, ACA and Engineers Australia have partnered to develop this Construction Engineering Learning Development Guide, which you'll hear about today. And we're really proud that we're actually launching this work that we've been, you know, a group of people have spent the last two years working very hard on. This partnership represents an important step towards addressing one of the biggest challenges our industry faces, its workforce capability and capacity. In the ACA's Constructing the Future, a framework for a sustainable construction industry, it outlines a vision for a vibrant and sustainable industry where high value social and economic project outcomes are consistently delivered in a collaborative and inclusive environment. The framework identifies three key pillars, which are essential to support a sustainable construction industry. Those three pillars are culture, commercial frameworks, and capability capacity. And we believe that those three pillars need to work together um, in order to achieve what ultimately we want, a sustainable industry for many, many years to come. The ACA Capability Capacity Board Committee, which I'm lead, lead of, aims to deliver initiatives to achieve a sustainable pipeline of people who are actively choosing to work within our industry. It's about building a workforce that has the skills or opportunities to develop those skills to deliver the exciting projects across Australia. As governments look to the construction industry to kickstart economies worldwide, Australia is also currently experiencing a record level of investment in infrastructure. This growing pipeline of work is fueling an infrastructure boom which is predicted to last for another 10 years. Our industry's ability to attract, retain and develop a skilled workforce has never been more critical. Infrastructure Australia's recent market capacity report predicts a major infrastructure investment is likely to at least double the current spending over the next three years, with demand for labour, plant and equipment two thirds higher than previous years. At its predicted, projected peak in 2023, the infrastructure workforce is predicted to be 48% short of demand. That's a deficit of 93,000 people with the majority of those people needed across Australia and Eastern states, given the geographic clustering of major infrastructure investment. We all know that the construction industry is a labour and skills intensive industry and engineering occupations are currently most at risk of shortages. With skill shortages likely to persist until 2028, this is a major concern for an industry which also has the lowest level of female uh, participation at just 
and which is already showing signs of increasing pressure under a peak demand for labour resources. With a larger and more complex infrastructure, we're seeing, more, see, we're seeing responsibilities increase for construction engineers with evolving obligations on engineers in various jurisdictions across Australia. In the past, we've often seen the majority of training for construction engineers being on the job learning. That is, skills and competencies learnt over time and knowledge that was transferred from project managers and senior project engineers all the way down to site engineers and graduates. And I'm sure there's many on this call today who have experienced that on the job learning where they followed a project manager or a senior project engineer, project after project and learnt along the way. However, with an industry that is increasingly under pressure to deliver a record pipeline of complex work with resources that are already stretched, it's the concept of on the job training that tends to suffer the most. We simply just don't have the time. The inconsistency in training and development of construction engineers has arguably created a cycle of promotions that presents a risk of engineers occupying roles and taking on responsibilities that often exceed their competency and experience levels. Right now, we're finding construction engineers are find, facing challenges with gaps on career progression, inconsistency in learning and development across the industry, and limited relevance of existing industry training courses. As you would understand, this misalignment of industry recognised skills and competencies and the limited relevance of existing industry training courses often requires businesses to make significant investment in training and development to address these skills gaps. But it's also important to recognise that the skills needed by construction engineers are constantly changing. Not only do construction engineers require the technical skills that we all know that they have and they've been delivering for many generations, more and more these days it's the human capability skills um, that are the challenging skills that engineers need to acquire. These human skills are often the most difficult and for many working in, this, in the industry, they're skills that have never been taught. So we often hear stories of engineers talking about emotional intelligence and mental health and psychological health um, and diversity and diversity of thought. And that's typically not, in, not skills that they learnt at university and it's certainly not something that they got on the job um, over the previous generations. But if engineers, are going, if engineers that are leading billion dollar projects, skills such as emotional intelligence, communication, stakeholder management and leadership become essential school skills in the toolkit. It's a combination of these human skills and technical skills which now form the minimum core competencies and skills of construction engineers today. Therefore, a sustainable industry must also be a forward looking industry and individuals and organisations need to find a way to be able to assess their current competencies against industry benchmarks. So today's launch of the Construction Engineering Learning Development Guide seeks to bridge that divide, placing focus not only on the unique technical skills and capabilities of construction engineers, but also the human skills that are needed at each stage of their career. In an industry first, the guide has been developed to align Engineers Australia chartered elements of competency. So that means when engineers go through the process of um, getting chartered, this guide will align with the elements that they can get chartered against. By overhauling the training development guidelines for construction engineers, the guide sets tighter benchmarks for a unique range of core skills and knowledge needed by construction engineers throughout their career. It also provides a platform for industry to incorporate these competencies into their current learning and development frameworks and to improve consistencies of skills across the sector. We know that many of the tier one construction companies or the large construction companies already have learning and development frameworks. And we know that you know, a lot of those are already aligned with chartership and competencies across the industry. However, the construction industry is made up of many more companies and this will give those other companies the ability to um, map skills across the sector. 
They'll be able to benchmark workforce competencies. They'll be able to supplement learning and development pathway, pathways and provide additional guidance to engineers on the range of core skills and knowledge needed throughout their careers. The release of the guide today marks a really important step in demystifying career pathways and creating learning and development opportunities that align with recognised standards, that will lead to greater engagement satisfaction and retention of construction engineers. It will also help attract a more diverse workforce in the engineering profession. We know that uh, we're not a very diverse industry. Uh, we um, as I said, we have 12% women in our industry, but we also are not very diverse in other areas as well. And those diverse groups or the ones that are coming into our industry, sometimes the career pathways for an engineer is a bit of an unwritten kind of science behind the scenes. They don't really understand where their career pathways are going. And this guide helps those individuals understand their career pathways and also understands where their gaps might be, and so therefore they can map their learning development opportunities to that. What's also exciting about the launch of the guide today is it marks the commencement of a new community of practice which will work with Engineers Australia to continue to lead a more formal support and collaboration initiatives for construction engineers in the future. What we have seen in the past is construction, Engineers Australia has represented the design community exceptionally well, um, but we haven't been represented for a number of different reasons. The construction engineers have not been represented to the, to the same level. So what this does is for the construction engineers, we have a new community of practice that is specifically for construction engineers and the challenges that they might, might have or face on their projects. So just to, I guess, wrap up, um, the capability capacity constraints represented, it represents a real risk to the sustainability of the construction industry and for the successful delivery of a record pipeline of infrastructure projects. And when combined with other industry issues, including lack of diversity and the need for cultural reform, the challenges are great, but they're not insurmountable. There are many opportunities to advance the construction sector by championing, championing cultural transformation, improving mental health, wellbeing and diversity of workforce. It is clear that a sustainable construction industry is also heavy, heavily reliant on the capability, capacity and skills of its workforce. Therefore, any development opportunities and career, clear career pathways are critical not only to retain those that are in the industry already, but also to increase its attractiveness to a diverse range of people. ACA's role is to bring construction stakeholders together to influence, advocate and generate a sustainable and progressive industry. The strategic partnerships, just like the partnership with Engineers Australia, play a really important role in achieving this vision. I am very proud today to be launching the Construction Engineering Learning and Development Guide. It's an excellent example of an industry collaboration which has produced a tool that will benefit the entire sector. It demonstrates industry's commitment to supporting capability and capacity development and to achieving the highest level of skill and professionalism for construction engineers for a sustainable construction industry now and into the future. I look forward today to hearing more perspective from my fellow panels and, uh, and on the future of sustainable construction industry. Thank you. Sarah, thank you for your presentation and insights and for declaring the Construction Engineering Learning and Development Guide officially launched. I agree, it is an excellent example of collaboration and industry commitment. So for all our uh, listeners and viewers today, the link to the guide will be posted in the description box of the platform, I believe, so keep an eye out for it there. You can also access it directly through the EA website. Uh, go to engineersaustralia.org.au, click on the government and policy link on the top right hand corner of the home page, and then on reports and the guide can be found there and the guide will also be available on the ACA website. 
So let's explore some of the main themes Sarah's raised today. I'd now like to welcome our panel for today's discussion. Starting with John Davies, Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Constructors Association. John Davies was appointed as the ACA's first CEO on the 1st of July 2020 after leading the Queensland Major Contractors Association for two years. He's over 30 years construction uh, industry experience supporting the successful commercial delivery of projects in Australia, the Middle East, UK and Asia. John is a passionate advocate for change. He's driven by a desire to ensure that every level of the industry is sustainable, resilient to boom and bust cycles and able to deliver the infrastructure society needs in a collaborative and efficient manner. I would also like to welcome our second panel member, Emma Peters, Project Manager at Athiona. With 15 years experience working on the delivery of major road, rail and mining infrastructure, Emma has a passion for bringing together diverse teams and helping younger engineers on their career development pathway. She's a project manager for Athiona working across a number of tenders and itching to get back into project delivery. Our third panel member is Duncan Gibb, Chief Executive Officer at Fulton Hogan Construction. Duncan was appointed CEO of the Fulton Hogan, Fulton Hogan Australia construction business in July 2017, having spent over 15 years in senior leadership roles with the company. With over 35 years experience in the construction industry, Duncan is well versed in all facets of infrastructure construction across Australia and New Zealand. Between 2011 and 2015, Duncan led the $2 billion rebuild of the Christchurch infrastructure, gaining recognition externally with awards, including the prestigious Brunel Medal. He recognises that success is created through highly motivated and empowered people and thrives in collaborative environments where relationships are key. And finally, Tom Laslett, Project Manager of the Infrastructure Division at John Holland Group. Tom has 15 years experience working in the infrastructure, building, oil and gas sectors with first-hand experience in the formation and delivery of projects in the construction industry. He has chartered through Engineers Australia in civil engineering, leadership and management and project management. He's a project manager in the infrastructure division of John Holland, currently working on the Sydney Gateway project for Transport for New South Wales. Tom is passionate about developing younger engineers and enhancing the capability and capacity of construction engineers. So please join me in welcoming our panel for today. There's certainly a theme running through those bios. I think, I, I think a real passion for developing uh, younger engineers and the engineering workforce for the construction sector um, more generally. So let's kick off our discussion and I'm going to start with a question for you, John, if that's okay. We're here to talk about building a sustainable construction industry for the future. What do we actually mean by a sustainable construction industry? Yeah, thanks, Jane. And, and uh, hi, everyone. Um, I think um, Sarah did uh, a great job of uh, explaining that in her presentation, but I think it's really important to, to emphasize those points because it really is critical, but it's also really straightforward. It's, it's very simple. The model that has been developed, and, and this is not just ACA, this is ACA in conjunction with the New South Wales and Victorian governments through the Construction Industry Leadership Forum that have developed this simple three-legged model. And it is sufficient capability, capacity and skills, equitable and aligned commercial frameworks, and an improved industry culture. But the real important thing to remember about this model is how each of those three key pillars is interlinked. And probably the best example I can give of that is if we look at the commercial models that we've utilized in Australia in the last 10 years, they've really driven an adversarial culture in our industry. And now that adversarial culture is impacting on our ability to attract and retain the people we need to into industry. And we've got a lot of problems that we need to fix as, as an industry. We've got governments of all levels relying on our industry to lead the economy forward on the basis that every dollar spent on infrastructure is a three dollar kick on to the wider economy. But as again, Sarah mentioned some of the st statistics there that, that demonstrate just how sustainable our industry isn't currently, is things like 25% of all business insolvencies in Australia are from the construction industry. 
the construction industry, if we look at productivity growth over the last 30 years, lags other major industries by 25%. Only 12% of our workforce are women, and that number decreases down to only 2 or 3% if we're looking at blue collar workers. But the most shocking statistic of all is that our workers are six times more likely to die from suicide than they are from a workplace incident. So it, with those sorts of statistics, it's hard to say that our industry currently is sustainable, but we do have a very simple model for addressing these issues. And this document, this really important document that's being launched today will go a long way towards addressing the capability and capacity um, pillar of that model. Wonderful. Thanks, John. And I think the three pillars that, that you and Sarah have both mentioned, and in particular, the interconnection between them um, is uh, uh, provides a really simple, but as you say, important model for, for starting to build uh, a more sustainable industry. Um, Sarah, Tom, Emma, uh, Duncan, do you have any thoughts to add uh, in addition to Sarah uh, and John's about what do we mean by a sustainable construction industry? What does that mean for you? Oh, I'll go jump in. Uh, you go, Duncan. Okay, so after being in the industry for close on 40 years now, um, to me, a sustainable industry is one that people want to actually be part of. We, we, we are an industry that's got incredible opportunities. It's a really exciting place to be. We're delivering real outcomes for the communities that we live in who are our client ultimately. Um, so a sustainable industry has got to keep people energized, keep people um, balanced in working and living, and therefore keep the industry able to continue to perform. And that needs um, a predictable pipeline of projects so that we can continue to keep people engaged. It needs a culture that is not the old, macho, male-driven, aggressive culture that I grew up in in the early 80s and 90s. Um, so we're moving forward, we're making intentional changes, and, and I think we are on a journey towards what will be a more sustainable industry. Thanks, Duncan. Emma, did you have a comment? Yeah, I think that um... To be a sustainable industry, we really need to refocus on our attentions on on how we deliver work. Uh, and I think there was a, a stat that you said there, John, about being six times more likely to die from suicide than from a, a workplace accident. So if we think about how much effort we put into um, to workplace preventing workplace accidents, and we should put that effort in, if we if we equal that effort uh, in uh, improving the the well being and mental health of our our employees will be a much more sustainable uh, business moving forward, industry moving forward. Yeah, thanks, Emma. Look, maybe we can delve into that a little bit. Both you, Duncan, have mentioned, you know, it, it, we, a sustainable sector means that the industry can, can, can perform well. And Emma, you've mentioned, you know, how we deliver our work sort of needs a little bit of exploration. So given that construction and infrastructure are seen as key sectors to drive economic recovery, there's a lot of focus on that. How do we balance increased demand for cost reductions and tight delivery timeframes with the desire for a sustainable and quality driven construction sector? Duncan, I might start with you. Have you got some thoughts on how we balance those at times competing demands for good outcomes given tight constraints? I think we need to start by recognising that the construction industry and sector is uh, inclusive of our client organisations, uh, design consultancies, and very importantly, our supply chain of subcontractors and, and suppliers, as well as constructors, all of whom uh, employ engineers. Um, and all of us are balancing the many uh, competing tasks that are involved in, in delivering projects across the industry. Um, if we look at cost reduction, 
you're talking about we as an industry need to um, be delivering good value to the, the people who are our clients. And I, I honestly think that starts with uh, having appropriate commercial arrangements, uh, specifically in balancing risk appropriately uh, and in, in driving a, a collaboration between all the different parties that, that come together to deliver the infrastructure. In terms of timeframes, um, too often timeframes seem to be driven by political imperatives or, or some fictitious dates rather than the actual time it will take to safely deliver the projects because a too tight a time frame leads to needing to work around the clock, which leads to stress, which leads to um, the well-being concerns and problems that, that Emma alluded to. So, you know, we need to balance those sort of issues along with the requirements that we have um, in terms of creating a, a culture that is attractive to people. We, we want to draw a diverse range of people into the industry to create better solutions through diverse thought processes. So, you know, there are all the different issues and, and competing interests that we need to pull together in service of a sustainable, economic, viable industry that delivers quality product for our clients. Thanks, Duncan. I think I think your point about setting projects up well from the start in terms of having appropriate commercial arrangements in place and balancing risk appropriately so, so that there's a share and fair understanding of how risk is allocated across the various parties is, is something that crops up a lot from the discussions I have. Um, John, Sarah, Tom, Emma, do you have anything to add about perhaps start setting up a project well from the start or any other aspects uh, for what we need to think about so that we can deliver high quality outcomes from construction and infrastructure projects? Yeah, Jane, I was going to just say, I don't know if the cost reductions are as prevalent as they have been in the past. Um, there's a lot of work out there, as we've sort of found out. Um, there's enough work to go around for everyone. You know, contractors don't need to outbid themselves to the bottom. Um, and I think this is a healthy, you know, part of the success of, of a project's future is making sure that there's rough, enough budget allowance so the stress doesn't get involved and stuff. Um, the clients also need to recognise good value. Duncan mentioned this as well, but it's not just necessarily good price. And, and as contractors, we need to understand what does the client want? And then rather than trying to get the lowest price, let's come up with a solution that may actually be a, a more favourable solution that, that they will ultimately want to pay more for. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I'll I, I just jump in uh, on, on that. The, the value for money is, is, is a key theme here. And um, it's such a big issue that the Construction Industry Leadership Forum, it's one of the three initiatives for this year, is to come up with a framework that better defines value for money than just that lowest possible price at the, at the tender box uh, that Tom mentioned there. Because that, that is key here. There's a whole range of things that, that are important to the clients than, than just lowest possible price. But I guess I'd also challenge the, the supposition around the original question that you posed there, Jane, in, in the, um, that some of these things have to be mutually exclusive, that, um, you, you know, if you, you can't have um, some of these um, sort of non-cost criteria, some of the like these, these better, better quality and, and, and quicker projects or lowest price and quicker projects or, or, or better um, cultural uh, outcomes um, that you've got to sacrifice, sacrifice price. I think that what we'll see is that the, actually the, there is um, a link between improved cultural outcomes and also improved productivity. So therefore price will come down and the time required to do it, uh, a project will come down, or at least they won't uh, necessarily increase. There won't be some um, in increase in cost or increase in time as a result of improved cultural outcomes and focusing on time for life uh, and improved well-being and all of these other things. So I think we've got to um, a bit of education to do around that fact that some of these things 
uh, are sort of mutually or not mutually exclusive. Um, but we also need to focus just as both Duncan and Tom have said on um, redefining what is value for money. Yeah, thanks, John. That's a really important point. I think it's a case of trying to get that feedback loop operating in the other direction, uh, which, which is excellent. Any other thoughts on perhaps competing or non-mutually exclusive factors for successful infrastructure projects? What does it mean? How do we balance cost, schedule, quality, sustainability, outcomes and well-being? How do we get it all moving in the right direction? Education, changing the conversation, new frameworks, new initiatives. Well, uh, look, uh, I'm on. always going to uh, jump in and give him uh, half the chance. Duncan, you, you, you were about to jump in there, but if, if, if not, I'm happy to go. Look, 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 frankly, I think that the industry just needs to dare to be to do things differently. If we keep doing what we've always done, we're going to get the same old old outcomes. We, we do need to intentionally look to draw in people from outside of the industry, maybe into our industry. We need to redefine how we work. Um, Emma mentioned it initially, but, but to me, redefining how we work means let's look at what an engineer does and draw out the administration stuff that we get bogged down in so that we can focus on being good engineers and, and, and do the stuff we're trained to. We need to look at how can we better utilise the experts that are out there that provide us expertise that we don't have. We need to um, really challenge ourselves to, um, to do things differently. Uh, I, I want to see new efforts at, at achieving better outcomes. Thanks, Duncan. That's really interesting and is a nice segue into the next question, which is going to unpack this idea of a shortage of engineers and skills and competencies. So interested, perhaps, Tom, in your thoughts initially about that. Is there a shortage of engineers? Um, is it only engineering skills that are in demand in the construction sector? Oh, and if it is engineers, what sorts of skills are in, in short supply? What, is, what does that demand signal look like at a slightly lower level of detail? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think Sarah touched on this in the intro. The development model for construction is broken. I, I think engineers finish with a university degree and they join a construction company. Um, this is where they realise the engineering processes around working in construction isn't actually covered by a university degree. Um, you know, there are a whole broader range of things that don't get covered by bending moment diagrams um, and stuff about how we actually deliver um, good engineering work. Um, traditionally, superiors and peers have provided education how we construct things, what we do day to day. You know, I, I think five to ten years ago, the industry ramped up with that demand for for work, and and as Sarah said, there's a lot more work coming in the in the future, um, and and with that was the the demand for engineers. You know. And this placed pressure on companies to find competent engineers in, in to do that um, develop the sorry to build the stuff um, a lot of companies felt it was a better solution to promote engineers already on a project and try and retain their workforce um, as there wasn't a lot of experienced engineers in the market so we see engineers promoted to levels higher than they would traditionally have been in the same time frame um, this is where experience you know time is where experience is gained not just learning so now we have an engineering workforce which hasn't had the opportunity to learn thoroughly how to do their job. And so we're now in a position where they should be educating the newer engineers, you know, ones that have just finished the engineering um, degrees. Um, but because they don't feel as competent, they don't put themselves out there as much, maybe in fear of being caught out or maybe because they're just too busy as well. Um, as such, the system where engineers learn on the job is struggling to equip the engineers. And, and to answer your question, what uh, you know, knowledge is, is really, lacking in it and they go to four years engineering degree to learn the real technical side of things they don't understand the process so you know it's inspecting um works on site quality assurance it's scheduling it's cost control it's managing a, a, a supervisor or foreman on site people skills you know there's a whole broad range of things that we need to understand and master to develop work properly 
Thanks, Tom. Um, I think you, you've raised a really important point there. It sounds like a couple of things are diverging here. Um, it's, it sounds like it's getting harder and harder, not easier and easier to get experience on the job due to numerous uh, pressures kind of coinciding. Um, and uh, some of the skills that are required aren't taught at university. But I was wondering, are the skills required also changing? Sarah mentioned in her presentation that uh, construction projects are becoming more complex. Are the skills required evolving? And is that exacerbating the problem? How are the skills requirements changing for your sector? Open to anyone to comment. Yeah. I, can, I can jump in there. So there's definitely more pressure on what we're calling the human skills. So those skills around managing people, leadership, communication, stakeholder management, um, mental health, it's just the, ment the, the sheer just managing of people. And if we think about an engineer that didn't get those skills at uni and has come out and is not learning on the job either, the level of pressure that those individuals are put under and, you know, the mental health stresses and, and the... Um, the numbers of engineers that are leaving the organisations because it's just too hard or stressful. Uh, there's definitely a need for the human skills and I think that's why the guide is so valuable because whilst the technical skills have always been there and there's some tweaking around the edges of technical skills and there's new demands around digital engineering and those other things, we've never seen a document that addresses the human skills. And so I think this is a really good way to start the conversation on if you're an engineer on a project and you're managing people and some of these teams are, if you're a project director, they're, they're, that's hundreds of people. You're essentially a CEO of an organisation. And if you haven't had that training along the way, I can imagine how um, stressful that might be for some. So this is a really good way to start to address that skills shortage and need and then you map the L&D to that and it, it, it gets our workforce and our engineering and our leaders to a place uh, where we need them to be for the future and for the industry to be sustainable. I also think what it does is attract more diverse views. So, um, you know, if you've got leaders that are more accepting of diversity and diverse skills and diverse views, um, it, it makes for a nicer environment to work. And as I mentioned in my presentation. I've been around for 25 years and uh, in the industry and I actually grew up in the industry. My father was in the industry and I describe myself as a bit of a survivor. Um, you know, it's, it's a bit like a, it's a dodgem cars in the construction industry if you don't automatically fit. And so we don't want every woman or anyone from a diverse background or someone from another industry to be described as a survivor. <laughs> We don't want them to have to come to work every day and it be a battle. And so I think if we're more inclusive culture, it makes it easier for those uh, more diverse group, groups to, um, to thrive and want to be here. Mm. Sarah, you mentioned that um, there's a real emphasis on the need for human skills at the moment. And I think, um, you know, there's been a real emphasis over the last 10 years or so on this, you know, more broadly than just the construction sector. Um, people refer to them as, as, you know, by different names. Um, some people refer to them as soft skills or 21st century skills or transferable skills. The World Economic Forum has been releasing their list for, for five or more years now on what the, the most important 21st century skills are. Do you think that we're just becoming better at recognising the importance of these skills or is there something about the complexity of projects and how interconnected they are that's also driving the need for these human skills? What, what do you think it is or is it a mix of both? We're becoming better at recognising how important they are? I think it's a, it's a mix of everything. Um, so, yeah, we are recognising how important they are because we have some challenges around mental health and all of those other things. Um, but also we have a skill shortage. We need more people. Um, so in order to attract them, we have to develop these skills. Otherwise, they're, they're not going to, if, unless we change, they're not going to be knocking down our door for a job. So uh, I think it's a mix of everything. The planets are aligning for us. Any other thoughts? I think uh, Emma, Just... Emma, and, Emma and Tom probably have a lot to say there as well. I would. Um... I would definitely agree that it is a mix of both. Uh, and one thing um, that I'm so pleased to see is that 
um, for a portion of our industry, um, there are people with great strengths in the human capability space. And I, uh, I think it's a really great thing to see uh, them being acknowledged as core skills uh, that we need to have and develop during our career. And it will be great to see uh, as we move forward now that we've recognized that their skills uh, to see more training programs uh, being developed around um, around ensuring that our engineers can develop these as they go. Thanks, Emma. We've started talking about yeah. skills. Oh, sorry, Tom, go ahead. I was just going to say that the, the jobs themselves are becoming a lot more complex. You know, we're talking about billions of dollars in some of these projects and, you know, not many businesses ever make or have a turnover of a billion dollars in their whole lifetime of work. And we're trying to smash this out in a, in a couple of years, you know, from going from nothing to complete of that sort of amount of spending is it's an incredible time frame to just really rush. It feels rushed sometimes um, to be able to plan, ex execute, and then deliver whilst managing all these interpersonal skills and um, safety and, you know, good product and everything. It, it is a lot more, um, complex than it ever used to be. Projects never used to be this size. Thanks, Tom. So look, we've started sort of talking about uh, the skill shortage, the engineering skill shortage and, and the capabilities that engineers ideally need in order to be able to, you know, work productively and with good sort of well-being. Um, and I can't remember if it was John or Duncan, but I think one of you mentioned that we need to get a, bit, a little bit creative and start to do things a little bit differently. Maybe we need to start attracting people from other sectors and other industries and try and get them into the construction uh, uh, sector. Um, but of course, there are other industries and sectors also facing skill shortages. So um, the challenge is, is shared. To what extent are an ageing workforce um, and, and try to rectify that gender imbalance. Um, you know, construction is at 12% women, engineering as a whole is 13% women, not much better. What can we do about targeting an aging workforce or addressing an aging workforce or tapping into the aging workforce for their lessons learned and wisdom? How can we kind of transfer that knowledge to the, to the younger uh, cohorts? And what can we do besides the culture shift that is needed uh, so that we move away from that survivor uh, kind of approach more to a, a more sustainable approach for gender and, and other, um, I guess, areas of diversity? How creative can we get? What other creative ideas can we look at? Uh, so I suppose well, my concern about... Oh, sorry. Ahead, <laughs> so uh, my concern... Um, so my concern about an aging workforce is that as people leave the industry, we risk losing a lifetime of experience and knowledge and skills. Uh, so as we head into this period of significant growth and we see businesses expand, new people join our industry, we need to make sure that we find ways to capture that experience and look for opportunities to engage these people in training and mentoring roles. I've often thought that wouldn't it be great if you saw project directors getting towards the end of their career, spending a couple of years stepping back into a 2IC role for their last couple of years and provides support to our emerging leaders in the industry. Uh, in terms of gender, I mean, women are, are half the population. We can't fix a capacity issue without addressing the issue of the gender imbalance. And there are so many things that we need to address to do that. Um, I've seen particularly um, some improvements in female participation, participation around graduate recruitment. So we've seen some successful 50-50 graduate programs being implemented, uh, and those are awesome to see. But unfortunately, we're still not seeing that translate to more women at a, an SPA level and up, and there the, the change is very slow. So we know that when it comes to applying for new roles and asking for promotions, um, women are more likely to wait until they think they tick every box whereas a man is more likely to apply for a job before they tick all those boxes. So you can imagine uh, how it may be detrimental if women don't even know what boxes they need to tick. So I think that's where something like the learning and development guide is really important uh, because it makes clear what those key skills are that you need to develop as you go, uh, step by step as you take each move within your career, and hopefully that that will lead to more women putting their hand up and saying that they're ready. Back to you, Jane. Thanks, Emma. Any other thoughts? How can we think creative? Can I just maybe... 
Yeah, sorry, a bit of a delay. Um, I, I think personally think that our women counterparts are a lot smarter than our than us men. Um, they they won't accept the work conditions that most of us males just accept. You know, this is what we've always done, so this is what construction looks like. Um, you know, they're, they're put, not putting their head up to say, well, that, that's not right. You know, long hours, a perceived level of commitment to the project it is it's not a natural way. Other sectors, other industries don't have that same level of demand. Um, and I think they, they choose to, to do something else, you know. I think what we need to do is make that working conditions better for all, not just for women. Um, I, I think it's the right thing to do for all our workforce. And I think by making it more inviting to attract the best possible candidates, male or female, um, to our projects will like um, Emma said, double the potential capability that we have within within the sector. It's a really good point. Yeah, I'll just uh, add, it... add, add on to that if I if I could, uh, Jane. Um, the and and uh, you only have to look at uh, my, my good friend Duncan here on the call, who's uh, who's retiring shortly. You know, we're wearing people out. Um, because and, and and this this time for life aspect is is really quite a crucial one on a whole bunch of levels. So uh, both Emma and, and and Tom talked there uh, from point of view of, of of women, but also the um, if we're talking about the aging workforce and 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 and, and older older people and uh, I sort of count myself in, in that now as well. That you you start to look for a way out because you're just worn out. Um, if we can address that time for life component, which is one of the three key pillars of the culture standard being developed by the construction industry culture task force, then not only will that help with um, attracting and retaining more women into our industry, but it will also help reduce the burnout of those that are further through their careers and potentially prolong their involvement in the industry going forward. Thanks, John. We've started to talk about retention in the workforce. Um, we've spoken also about, you know, how do we improve the pipeline? How do we attract people in to the sector? How do we build the capability and skills so that they can progress uh, through their career? But retention then also becomes something very important. Is there anything that we need to be thinking in addition to what we've already spoken about, about retaining the workforce? We don't want to wear people out. We don't want to burn them out. Um, we want to make the make good use of our, of our older, more experienced, wise cohort, enable that transfer of knowledge. How do we keep people in, in the sector for longer? Are you finding that attrition rates are particularly high? Is that a particular challenge for construction because of burnout? I think what Sarah think is, mentioned um, before. Yeah, sorry, Sarah, go on. Yeah, that's okay. So our, um, yeah, our turnover rates, and it'll be every company is experiencing exactly the same thing. Our turnover rates are, are increasing. Um, we tend to be stealing people from each other, which is not sustainable. Um, we, I think what we need to do and we need to, and I think we've started with um, ACA and the Construction Industry Leadership Forum. The construction industry has realised that it's not working alone on this. Previously, we would have tried to solve our problems on our own and got nowhere. Um, now we're collaborating with government, we're collaborating with Engineers Australia, we're doing lots of things to look industry-wide because it's not just us, it's the government, it's us, we're a part of a supply chain and so it's all of our um, suppliers that need to work together and um, work on using documents like we're launching today to develop the career of individuals, making it more, more meaningful work um, taking away the the burden of every day, like as John said, we're wearing our people out. There's too much stuff that they need to do. So we need to get smarter, do more with less, um, invest in digital, uh, take out processes. Oh, it's so um, it's such a big task to do. So there's not just one prong that we have to address here. But I think if we do it together as an industry and industry wide will have a greater chance of shifting that dial than any individual company doing it alone. 
Sarah, you raise an interesting point there, you know, that in some instances, companies are starting to compete with each other. But of course, uh, construction is competing with other engineering sectors as well. And unfortunately, or fortunately for engineering, because the engineering mindset and skill set is so transferable, we're actually competing with other job types as well. Um, only 60% yeah. of qualified engineers work in an engineering role. Um, uh, and certainly from my experience, recent and not so recent, um, other, other sectors and professions do a really good job at enticing graduates in um, with quite polished pitches. Um, so, does engineering more generally, but also construction in more specifically, need to do a better job at selling um, in an authentic way uh, what a career uh, as an engineer in the construction sector looks like? Do we need to, to be better storytellers to ignite people's imaginations um, a little bit better? Um, clearly, um, the people who have worked so hard on this learning and development guide are passionate about construction. Sarah, you mentioned that you love it. You love, you've loved your 25 years in the construction sector. Is there, is there something about getting those stories out more widely to encourage people in and to remind people why they're part of the sector who are already in it? Absolutely. I, you know, I think that um, we are not very good storytellers. Uh, we don't. We should, we should be very proud of what we do and what we deliver in communities every single day. And what we do is very tangible. And, you know, anyone in this industry that's grown up in the industry, you know, I've heard generations of stories of my family who have developed stuff. And let me tell you, it's pretty boring compared to what I do today. But they're still stories. And, and that's what attracted me to the industry when I first joined the industry. And I think that we need to get better at telling our story as an industry and the value that we provide to communities every single day. I, I, um, I, think, I, yeah. I think we need to be balanced in making sure we tell the stories, but the stories have got to be legitimate, right? So yeah. th there is that inspiring aspirational piece about uh, what engineers do because we make society a better place to live without sewerage and exciting stuff like that, life is pretty unbearable, i got to tell you, from rebuilding a city that had no sewerage. Uh, you know, so you can tell these stories and there are great stories, but at the same time, we've got to improve our culture. We've, we've got to make this place that is our industry um, more conducive to drawing people in. We've got to get better at, at, at making flexible work arrangements. We've got to get better at enabling people to have a balance between life and work. We, we've, we've just got to be really intentional about improving the space that is our industry so that we can build our stories around a culture and an environment that is absolutely fantastic and enjoyable and is conducive to a great life. And I've had 40 years of absolute excitement and, and challenge and growth opportunity, and it's just available out there now, and it's a much better place to be than it used to be, I've got to say. Thanks, Duncan. Any other thoughts? Tom, were you, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I, I suppose from my point of view, um, the, typically I, I think, sorry, I forgot what I was gonna say. Um, the the way that people really enjoy the the, the jobs, I guess, um, it, it's the admin stuff that that probably burdens us down and keeps us a bit unenticed. You know, we're still using paper dockets to do cost control. You know, there's a much better way of doing that. There, there, there's got to be a better systems and process that we, as you know, technical minded people, can develop and get to a spot. We're all trying to do this ourselves. Each company is trying to develop their own system. Like this is something that collaboration could put some really thought process into and get a really good outcome that, that's going to benefit all of us. You know, and then ultimately you're going to be a lot less time focused on on the admin side. You know, sorry, I, I've just remembered what I was going to say. And and I'm involved in the graduate intake at John Holland, and quite often what I find is that the, the graduates, you know, been thousands of people to get into this into the room as a as an in, interview. And you ask them, what do you think you're going to be doing first day on the job? And they, they think you're going to be 
transforming lives and all these things that are part of the values of, of each of the company they're interviewing for. But, you know, they think they're a part of a design force going to go into building the next metro or tunnel or whatever. You know, I think we need to do better at educating what the construction industry looks at. So when they actually come into the door to, for a job, you know, they're, they're actually setting themselves up for a success because that's what they want to do when they apply. Um, I, I think there's too many people that don't know exactly where they want to go, put their hand up, and then that's where we lose them because it's not what they expected. Thanks, Tom. I think we need to um, be better at innovating. And I think that's that's what you know Tom is talking about. It, it even goes to creating better innovative solutions to problems that are otherwise constrained by very specific specifications that clients own and won't change because that's the way they've always done it. So we need to get more collaborative with our clients, with, with design consultants, to actually enable us to free up and let these young minds that are coming out of university innovate and, and, and come up with different ways of doing things. Um, and that's the challenge for us old, old blokes and, and, and women before we leave the industry. How do we create a framework that empowers people to innovate more um, to deliver better outcomes? That's an excellent question. Any thoughts from our panellists? How would we do that? How do we provide Duncan, the context Duncan. for better innovation? I think uh, Duncan raised a, a key point. I think it was I think it was Duncan. Um, you know the, the specifications that we the clients, a lot of our clients, especially government clients, are have these very prescriptive specifications that uh, leave very little opportunity for innovation. And it's probably one of the reasons why we still construct roads largely like the Romans built roads. You know, why don't we introduce performance based specifications and, and provide an opportunity for innovation? And then we look at if we look at things like digital engineering, we have um, lots of technologies out there. I um, mean, to, to Tom's uh, comment around uh, dockets, there's a solution called Docket Book out there. There's solutions to, to lots of things out there, but they're not getting it adopted. Why are they not getting adopted? Because at their heart, a lot of these technologies rely on open and transparent sharing of information. But the contractual models that we utilize to deliver our projects drive exactly the opposite behaviors. They drive the behaviors of holding on to information because I might be able to use that as a claim against you or defend a claim from you. We've got to address these fundamental roadblocks. There's a few fundamental roadblocks like those. And I think that if we can address them, we'll see significant change. And I'm really heartened that I think that COVID has finally provided us with that burning platform where we'll start to see movement on all of these issues. Well, that's excellent news. And you've mentioned a few things uh, there, John. Uh, COVID, digital technologies, the open sharing of information uh, being prevented through contractual arrangements. Um, it's a bit of a difficult question, um, but you say COVID has provided the context and the burning platform to make change. What's the next step? How do we actually start making change? We we've kind of ticked a pretty big box with the learning and development guide that will go a long way um, to providing consistency and clarity on what skills are needed as one progresses their career in the construction sector but what are what of those other two pillars that sarah spoke about culture and the contractual framework what's the next step in culture and contractual frameworks is there something like the learning and development guide um, are we starting to think about that for those two other pillars well, I'm going to jump in there and not waste that opportunity. Uh, I really appreciate that, Dorothy Dix, uh, uh, there, um, Jane. Yes, in terms of culture, absolutely. Um, the Construction Industry Culture Task Force has just prepared a draft culture standard, which is now out for consultation. And please, all of you that are watching at the minute, pick up your pen and your paper and write down this, cultureinconstruction.com.au. 
If you go there, you can find out all about the culture standard and, and that has a, another three limbed model, which is focused on improving time for life, well-being, and diversity and inclusion as being established as being there, the three key ingredients for changing the culture of our industry. But all of you on this um, call today are all welcome. And in fact, I actively encourage you all to go to that website and to look at that culture standard, because this is so important for our industry. You've heard us talking about this, all of us talking about the importance of changing and improving the culture of our industry. And you can all, every single one of you, have a part to play in this by going to cultureinconstruction.com.au, getting yourself informed and actively providing feedback to um, that culture standard. Great, thanks, John. Sarah, do you want to make any other comment around those two pillars, both the culture piece, but also the contractual side of things? Is there, are there any initiatives underway to look at the transparency, the information sharing piece, um, you know, re-establishing new protocols for contractual obligations and so forth? Yeah, look, uh, that's probably, the culture side is probably my area of expertise and the commercial side, I, I'd probably leave to maybe Duncan or um, one of the other panellists. But definitely, as, as John mentioned, the culture standard is a big piece of work for us. Um, and that definitely, um, will go a long way to addressing many of the, you know, the culture issues in attracting people. But what I did say earlier in my keynote speech is if we, we can't address the culture unless we address the commercial model, um, you know, we can't attract more in the organisation, more women, if we've still got this adversarial, um, you know, uh, way in which we work, particularly from a commercial standpoint. So there's lots of work that's being done in the commercial space. Uh, there's teams of people who have been working on standard agreements and other things. So there's lots of work, but that's not necessarily my area of expertise. Great. Thanks, Sarah. That sounds promising. Um, Duncan, Tom, Emma, just on that, Jane. comment? Just, yeah, just on that, Jane, it, it's really important to... John mentioned the Construction Industry Leadership Forum. So that's, um, we call it the SILF because we love acronyms. So. Um, so they're doing pieces of work on those three legs of the stool, on the culture piece and the capability piece, which Sarah leads, and there's a commercial team. And, and that's actually being led by, by governments from New South Wales and Victoria. So the fact that we've got very senior level players in government organisations that are the delivery vehicles for infrastructure and in in construction companies and and construction organisations, that we've got that high, very high level commitment to get together and work to resolve some of these issues. Clients recognise that we have a massive amount of work to deliver. We've got a finite um, capability at the moment within the country, um, and therefore. We need to have more effort in coming up with collaborative forms of, of working and Victoria are doing a lot of work in that space through the level crossings and the MRPV. There's all sorts of things happening. The New South Wales government and Transport for New South Wales are, are, are investigating and challenging themselves to come up with um, better ways of working together. So there's a lot of work going on. There's a very high level commitment and it is, it's very positive from my perspective to see this sort of um, progress being made, but we've still got a long way to go. Uh, all I can say is that it is encouraging that we are heading in the right direction. And over the next 10 years, I think quicker than 10 years, we will see some very substantive change in, in that commercial framework space. Thanks a lot, Duncan. I'll just add to that one thing that has impressed me in the Construction Industry Leadership Forum and the uh, Victorian Government, New South Wales Government and ACA and industry working together is they're coming up with these new ideas of collaborative frameworks, but they're also measuring their success each year. So there's a, a, a measure, often you, you know, you see governments and, and industry coming up with these new ideas and then just implementing them, then walking away. Um, but what I've seen, in, particularly from the SILF, is this commitment to measuring the success and measuring change. 
and I think that that's really encouraging that we will see change in the future. Still a lot of work to do, but it's heading in the right direction. Yeah, I'll just jump in there and, and and say yeah uh, to expand on that that um, I literally just came from the, the meeting I had uh, before jumping in, into this discussion was with the New South Wales government around just exactly what uh, Sarah's talked about there, um, looking at a scorecard that, that measures progress against uh, the New South Wales government ten point commitment to industry and. Um, both ourselves as in ACA looking at measuring uh, performance, the New South Wales government themselves uh, uh, reflecting and looking at their own performance. We as an industry association have our own 10 commitments, which you can find on our website and uh, some self-reflection there as to how well we're uh, progressing with this. And um, you'll, you'll see if you keep an eye out on our social media channels um, uh, in the next couple of weeks, some communications around just that. And, and, and what is pleasing to see is that there is progress in terms of the, the 10 commitments across all 10 commitments. What um, needs to happen now is that pace of change needs to increase. And this is the, the COVID opportunity, the COVID imperative the government's relying on industry to lead the economy forward. This is the thing that will spur the, the, the pace, increase the pace of reform, I think, exactly as Duncan says. I think um, there is some really good stuff that's happening that, that's maybe not visible to a lot of people, but you will start to see some significant improvements, hopefully, in the commercial space in, in, in quite a short space of time. Thanks, John. Look, we've got some time left, but there are still some topics that we wanted to cover. Um, I might go to the topic of sustainability if, in an environmental sense. Um, we couldn't speak about a sustainable industry without addressing that angle. Uh, so, so, John, I might uh, go again to you in the first instance. What do you think are some of the roadblocks currently facing the sector in terms of moving towards a more sustainable one from an environmental and resource use perspective? What's happening this in this space within the construction industry? Yeah, thanks, Jen. I, look, I, I don't think there's any lack of willingness from an industry perspective to, to move on this. Abs ab in fact, absolutely not. We had a, an ACA board meeting last week, and, and this was a key area of conversation around what can we do as an industry to move things forward? But to a certain extent, we're very much reliant on our clients to, to, uh, to lead the way. We I often say that um, if, if you asked a construction company to go and build you a pink elephant in the middle of a field, absolutely, that's what they would go and, go and do. Um, we do what our clients, generally speaking, ask us to do. And this, again, is probably a function of the, the uh, specification issue I talked about and Duncan mentioned as well, in that we, we have, generally speaking, very little opportunity for innovation because our clients are extremely prescriptive about what it is that they want us to do. So if you're not going to shift that um, prescription, then to see movement in this area, you really need to see that prescription incorporate requirements around environmental sustainability. But what we're seeing, or certainly what, I, what I've seen um, in this area that as, as being a bit of a role model potentially is in the UK. Obviously, the UK has just hosted COP26, by some degree, probably not a huge, great success. But one of the things that's come out of it in the UK is that they, they have a net zero um, commitment. And what the UK government has done there is that they've gone to all major industry groups and targeted and, and asked them to come up with specific plans as to how they will contribute and help meet the 2050 net zero commitment. So the construction industry, for example, through the Construction um, Leadership Council have come up with a an initiative called uh, Construct Zero, probably not uh, too um, uh, clever with the, the, the naming there or uh, interesting with the naming. But um, what that is, if you go to it and, and again, encourage everyone to go and uh, Google that and have a look at that, there's really quite a bit of detail in there about how they're going to uh, lead the industry towards achieving those targets. So I think 
here, unfortunately, we're sort of following the lead of the federal government, which, as we all know, is, is not particularly strong in this area. And, and, and therefore, we're not seeing a great deal of, of action, especially from a, an infrastructure perspective in this area. I think what we'll see is the states probably taking more of a lead in this area. They've all got their own individual commitments from a sustainability perspective, but we haven't necessarily seen those flow through into um, distinct plans, industry specific plans around that. I think that will start to happen. But for industry, really, uh, we, we've got a great passion to want to contribute here, but we've got to have the hands untied from behind our back if we're going to really make a significant contribution. Thanks, John. And I'd, I'd really like to hear from all the other panellists as well on the environmental uh, and resource use angle of sustainability, because it's such an important area, especially um, so soon after COP26. Um, you know, John's mentioned uh, a couple of aspects there, um, you know, action at the state government level, um, uh, other governments in other jurisdictions such as the UK asking industry associations and different industries what their uh, contribution is going to be, but that you are, you know, at the beck and call of clients. Do you have any other suggestions or ideas for how the construction sector can move forward in incorporating um, more sustainable um, business models and, and to act more sustainably uh, in big and small projects? Duncan, and then we might go Tom, Sarah, Emma. Look, what are the challenges? Are there any challenges or roadblocks? I think in terms of uh, the lower the lower level work that we're doing on projects, I think most projects are doing really good work in that sustainability space. Um, the, the part of sustainability that I want to focus on and have been in our business is is in the the, the people side of, of of sustainability. For us as an industry to continue doing what we're doing, we have to get better at, at, at developing the resource that is our business. We achieve everything through people, whether it's uh, subcontractors. We don't do enough to develop our subcontractors. As the major contractors, we focus on our people. But we should be doing, we should be expanding that right out into, into the, the subcontractors that we work with day in, day out with the supply chain. We've, we've got to get better at engaging with Indigenous organisations and I know a lot of the projects that we do remotely, we're, we're, we're bringing in and working with the local Indigenous um, organisations to get traineeships and, and to, to bring them into the workforce. Uh, you know, there's lots of things that we're doing. Um, but, but as John said, to me it's the golden rule. He who is the gold makes the rules. and the clients are nowadays getting more and more in that space of um, encouraging sustainable issues in the in the way we deliver through incentivizing those those issues as requirements in our contracts so that's good we are we are moving forward um, but really Sarah's the specialist in this space in our in, in our team so I'll hand over to her. At some point, I thought that was coming my way. Um, so yeah, look, I, I I feel that I have to speak on this topic given that I am on the board of the Infrastructure Sustainability Council. Um, I do think the industry as a whole has moved sign a, a significant, you know, they, they have moved significantly over the last five, ten years. Um, they, you know, almost every construction project over a hundred million dollars in Australia is now has a rating um, and I would say that the contractors are no longer kicking and screaming that they're coming in with innovative ideas and they do want to actively engage and get a better outcome. Sustainability overall, environmental sustainability is definitely on the forefront of every single uh, sort of the younger generation, the new employees that are coming into our organisations but it is also part of the organisations realise that 
in order for them to be sustainable, they need to get on board and, and start, you know, proactively and intentionally making a difference in the environmental sustainability space. What John has said is real though, um, and, and Duncan touched on it as well, is the barriers that we face around, um, around specifications, okay. around project timeframes. You know, um, we, we need to, in some areas, we need to be really innovative and there's, there's not enough time to be innovative, get a specification change, get the contract change and then implement. So those barriers are real. And if we really want to shift the dial, we need to find a way to have these conversations outside of the project world because once you're in a project, it's really hard to really make a significant difference. Uh, you can make a small difference and you can do your best and that's what I would say the majority of our construction companies do these days. However, in order to really move and change the way we do things or change the materials that we use, which we all know are carbon intensive, um, we need to take that conversation outside of the projects. How we do that, it's, it's usually through collaboration and what we're doing today um, and working with you know, other industry organisations such as the in the material sector, they have a huge part to play when it comes, particularly to when it comes to carbon and they're really innovative. They have a lot more time to be innovative because they're not in the project world. So, I think if we engage them as an industry as a whole and also engage our clients, which I think we're getting there, it's still a long way to go. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Tom or Em, I'm not sure if you've got anything to add there. You, Tom, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say it, it's been said already, but it's, it's I think the project delivery teams really want to turn sustainability, but it's the, the specification sides of like the pavement designers or the bridge designers and stuff that that really dictate what's in that specification you know that the left hand needs to talk to the right hand with our clients mm. um I, I generally think as well i'll touch on not just on the jobs we're already doing but engineers and construction will play a big part in in getting to a net zero or whatever that the prime minister's just announced you know a lot of projects that are going to come on board around you know, pumped hydro or solar and stuff. And, and it's really our responsibility to pick those up and deliver them successfully as well for the wider community. Thanks, Tom. Um, I might, we've we're, got a few minutes left. I want to bring the conversation back to the learning and development um, guide um, and then go around the panel for your final thought. So a little bit of a heads up. You know, we've spoken a lot today about, you know, far-reaching topics. Um, so if you were to emphasise one point, what would it be? But Emma, I might start with you bringing the conversation back to the Learning and Development Guide and just ask the panel, but but Emma, in the first instance, what? how would individual engineers engage with this Learning and Development Guide? What is your recommendation for how individual engineers engage with it? How should they use it? But also engineering organisations, how can they engage with it? How can they use it? Well, I think the uh, learning and development guide is a, a really important tool to use when you're thinking about um, your career path. So perhaps through your performance reviews and setting your career plans. So I think it's always been um, relatively easy for young engineers to understand what their zero to two year pathway might be like, because typically it will involve, you know, taking the next step. But it is far more challenging to think about what the path looks like beyond that. So what's so great about the guide is that it's providing you with that step by step from from a graduate when you join the industry until you get to a project manager all the skills that you need to develop along the way and that can help inform conversations about what projects you might go to what training you might need where you sit on that uh, range of skills uh, so i think it's really a conversation about uh, career development and career planning and that's where it can have a, a great impact on on young engineers fantastic thanks emma does anyone have anything to add on the learning and development guide, recommendations for how either organisations, um, you know, senior uh, staff members um, and individual engineers can engage with the learning and development guide. How could it be used? Well, look, I'd like to throw another challenge out there. Um, I take a lot of taxis around the place uh, and you'd be surprised how many taxi drivers say, yeah, I'm an engineer, but I can't work in this country because my qualification is not accepted. Yeah. I, I can't get a job because I don't have 
relevant Australian experience. So I look at this guide and I go, this is an ideal opportunity to take new Australians who have immigrated over here or, or, or refugees or whatever, who have experience in this industry, and we can use this framework to maybe take them on as trainees, but work through the framework to identify the gaps in their skill set that will enable them to grow in to get the accreditation and get the experience and, and be useful to our industry in their engineering skill set. Um, mm. here's, here's an ideal opportunity to draw in people who are already in the country who can add value to our industry and need a way to do so. And we can use this framework to help grow them and get them accredited and, and, and actively involved. Duncan, that's such a wonderful way to, to finish our panel discussion, I think, and um, I couldn't agree more. Um, the un and underemployment rate of our skilled migrants is double that for domestically trained engineers for a range of reasons, including the ones that you've mentioned, a perceived lack of local knowledge and local networks and uh, um, skills. So I think, I think that's a great idea. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left, so I, I did promise to go around the panel and ask for your final thoughts. Um, we do have some final announcements to make as well and squeeze in before the half hour comes up. So I might ask everyone to just uh, contribute one uh, succinct final thought. Um, Sarah, we might start with you if that's all right. What's the one thing that you'd like to emphasize out of the discussion today? I think uh, the one thing I'd like to emphasize is this is an industry first. Um, there's lots of this has been industry people contributing a lot of time outside of their day jobs to do something that is great for the industry. I'm proud, for that, proud of that and I hope that anyone, everyone on the call picks up the document and uses it and, and you know, helps to attract more engineers to our industry but keeps the ones within it already. Thank you, Sarah. Emma, what's the one thing you'd like to share with the group? I would say uh, that it's clear a lot of people have put a lot of good work into this and the ball is really in our court now. So I would just encourage people to, to click on the link, open up the document and start using it. Thanks a lot, Emma. Tom. Yeah, I think for me, um, I'd love to engineer skip plan. Um, they need to shape their own development. Your, your career's in your own hands. Um, what I'd really love to see is learning and development teams of ACA, but also wider audience, you know, members of the lower second or third or fourth or fifth or tenth tier uh, organisations pick it up and really educate, use this to educate their workforce. Um, it's not just for the ACA bodies. Um, it's designed for all construction engineers, um, including clients and subcontractors. It's the whole supply chain. Um, this includes design managers. It includes estimators. It's been written in a way that's going to shape anyone within the construction industry. So I really encourage everyone to pick it up. Thanks a lot, Tom. Duncan. I'd like to sort of build on where Tom was going. Um, in the industry, we've set aside our self-interest in the area of health, safety and well-being. My challenge is to all organisations out there, client, constructor, designer, supply chain, um, let's set aside our self-interest and start sharing more openly, start utilising things like this framework to develop the people in the industry, whether it's rotation between our organisation and a client and a savvy and a designer, to, to provide rapid rapid um, experience in all the different facets of the industry, whatever it is, let's set aside our self-interest uh, for the benefit of, of the whole industry. Thank you, Duncan and John. Culture, culture, culture. Um, Go to www.cultureinconstruction.com.au, get informed and be involved. You all have a part to play and can influence the outcomes here and to drive a more sustainable construction industry. 
Thank you, John. Well, that brings us pretty much to time, I'm afraid. I'd like to thank all our panellists today and again, all the contributors to the Construction Engineering Learning and Development Guide. It's been an enormous collaborative effort that's resulted in an industry-wide standard for skills and competencies. Engineers Australia is working towards a construction area of practice for the Charter Credential, for which there will be a further announcement early in the new year. It will be an important development allowing construction engineers to be recognised for their competencies in this area of practice. The guide is a significant resource for supporting construction engineering practitioners and the sector more generally. And I think the construction engineering uh, industry has shown what can be achieved through collaboration. And I hope that other sectors and areas of practice will be inspired by what construction engineering has achieved and follow suit. Engineers Australia would like to announce that the Australian Construction Achievement Award is now in its 25th year and the 2022 ACAA will be presented at the gala dinner on Wednesday the 4th of May in Sydney during the Future Construction Summit. The ACAA brings together the best construction projects delivered by the nation's very best construction companies. The call for entries closes Thursday 20th of January 2022, so start thinking about and planning your nominations. That's all we have time for today. Please join me once again in thanking Sarah Marshall, John Davies, Duncan Gibb, Emma Peters and Tom Laslett for their time and insights shared at today's session. We'd appreciate your feedback on the program today to help us improve and plan future sessions. Please complete a short feedback form which is linked in the description box down below. Thanks again for joining us and we hope to see you at the next webinar.